Vets, stories of service is sponsored by Shula's Steakhouse, themed after the 1972 Miami Dolphins' perfect season. Shula's, America's Steakhouse, still undefeated, located in the Hilton Naples. Shell Point Retirement Community, located on the Caloosahatchee River, this resort lifestyles retirement community provides a variety of living options and a full array of health care services. Pearl, Freeman & Cool, a local law firm representing victims of financial fraud and serving clients in the areas of personal injury, probate, and all areas of civil and commercial litigation. And by the Holocaust Museum and Education Center of Southwest Florida, where each year 15,000 students grades K through 12 participate in their education programs and learn why respect for others is so important. with the Navy all my life in Pensacola. So I went straight to the Army, and that's where I went. And from there I went to basic training, Camp Blanding in North Carolina, and trained on the 105 Howitzer. And from there, I went from one camp to another camp, and then finally I got on a, a boat full of soldiers, and it was uh, going to England, and it was the Wakefield, and it went out of Boston, and there were uh, over 8,000 soldiers. It took us five days to get over, and we only had one torpedo attack during that time because it went so fast, this, this ship. So finally, we got to uh, Plymouth, England, and went into this big barracks. That night, we had the best meal I've ever had in my life. And as the buddy said to me, he's a fattenessing up for the kill. <laughs> and the next morning, we went down on the boats and headed out to France. I was assigned to the 1st Infantry Division. Our squad leader was Sergeant Stamborski. He was an old man, 36. We were 18, 19 years of age. He was a father to us. And in Normandy, a German 88 split his back open and he nearly died. And he went to England to recuperate. At the end of that recuperation period, the surgeon said to him, Sarge, you can go home now. You've seen enough war. And you know what he said? He said, no, uh -uh. I want to go back to my outfit. And we were in this little farmhouse, and the guy comes running up the road and said, Stamborski. And we, we couldn't believe it, that he'd come back. And he, we said, you're crazy, what, what did you come back for? And he said, because I knew you guys couldn't win the war without me. And we love that guy. And then on December 16th, the Germans broke through in the Battle of the Bulge with their Tiger tanks, Panther tanks. It was unbelievable. We piled onto trucks and went into the Ardennes to go back to the fight. And it was the first time in my life that I'd ever seen American soldiers retreating. It was unbelievable, the power of the Battle of the Bulge. Christmas Eve, Sergeant Stamborski stepped on a mine and was killed. I'll never forget that Christmas Eve. Every Christmas Eve, I think of him, what he meant to us, what he contributed. And I didn't go in on Omaha Beach Day. I was sitting out as a replacement. But I wrote this poem 10 years after the war, Omaha Beach. When we went in, the beach had been taken. The living fought on, the dead forsaken. We were dropped into water up to our shoulders. We waded in, a group of green soldiers. I'll never forget that beach. I'll never forget the men in the ships, in the air, on the land, and in the water. They lie now 
beneath thousands of white crosses and stars of David above the beach. Those, those wonderful soldiers who died so young, they died so we could be free. The bravery and the courage of our men is something that history should acknowledge and always remember that this is something that we should be very proud of. I went into the Army in February of 1944. I was 18, like many others. My basic training was at Camp Landing, which is near Jacksonville. And it was a training center and a replacement center during that part of the war, from 44, 45, and probably even earlier. From there, I went to what was called radio school in uh, Fort Benning in Georgia. And from there, I was sent overseas. I was in the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, I was first wounded in the Battle of the Bulge, actually, uh, in February of 1945. As the war was ending and immediately after the war, I edited an Army newspaper. It was during that period that someone said to me, there is a refugee camp uh, at a hospital uh, not too far from here. I was stationed in a place called Kaufbeuren, which is about 60 kilometers southwest of Munich. And uh, they said, uh, these are survivors from concentration camps who are there. And they said, make a good story. I saw horrors, that is, groups of survivors. Most of them could not walk. Many were just lying on stretchers on the ground, and uh, almost all in their striped concentration camp uniforms. They lacked food, clothing, and medicines because the U.S. Army and the occupation forces were not prepared to take care of some 10 to 20,000 survivors of the concentration camps who were in that area. It was essentially the, the British and American zones. And they would continue to die. That is, there were hundreds dying every week because they had no subsistence. I went back to buddies in my camp and I said, what can we do? Let's try to help these people. So well, what we did were a number of things. We would steal food from our own mess hall and take to the people at this hospital at St. Otinian. But winter was gonna come on and they were still dying by the dozens every week. Edward Herman and I decided then what we ought to do is to let the people know in America what was going on. So we wrote a long letter to the American people accusing them of continued genocide by neglect. Then we sent them out to families, friends, relatives, organizations all over the states, asking them to send food and clothing and medicines. Nothing came, nothing arrived. We didn't know what had happened. Finally, we found out after a couple of months, the packages had been sent as we had asked them, but they were being held up at a port of embarkation in New York by the authorities because they were concerned that these packages might be used for black market or otherwise. One of our letters reached the desk of President Truman. He asked the Dean of Pennsylvania Law School, Earl Harrison, to investigate. He sent him as his emissary to the International Refugee Organization in Europe. The upshot of it was that September 30th, 1945, front page headline of the New York Times said, President orders Eisenhower 
to end new abuse of Jews, likens our treatment to that of the Nazis. Everything changed. Packages were released, some 1,400 of them, which we brought to St. Ottilian and distributed to other camps in the area. Thousands of people's lives were probably saved, and these were survivors. Memorial Day to me is a time of rededication, not to go out and only remember what had happened, but to dedicate ourselves to doing what we can now, each one of us individually in our own particular area where we live, where we work, and our social life, to prevent the kinds of hate that lead to war and to do everything we can, everything we can, to prevent future wars. I went to Yale when I was, uh, I guess, 18. And I was at Yale for four years. And uh, at Yale, I joined the Navy. I got training in Annapolis to learn to make charts by radar. Very few people had that. And very few people knew anything about it. But I did, and so I had a special little deal. It was so special that they sent me to General MacArthur, and he took me to make a lot of landings. But the reason for that was that the U.S. Air Force was in Australia, and they ordered the Air Force to bomb Tokyo. And the, the airplanes could bomb Tokyo, but they didn't enough have gas to come back to Australia. So they had no place to land. So General MacArthur was ordered to take all the little islands to build airfields so they could land instead of going back to Australia. Thank goodness we had a good president. Franklin Delano Roosevelt at that time was very, very good. He put us all together before he was president, he was secretary of the Navy, and he made the Navy fabulous. And the U.S. Navy is still the most fabulous Navy in the world by far. You could put all the other navies together and it wouldn't compare with the U.S. Navy. Late in the battle uh, with Japan, the United States Navy had a, had a group at Pearl Harbor and because they had a Korean on the staff there, he helped them break the Japanese code. So when the Japanese code was broken, they knew everything the Japanese were gonna do, and they were gonna capture Midway. So Admiral Halsey was captain of all the aircraft carriers. He was great, he was wonderful. The only trouble was he got sick. So they sent another man, very, very good, with the aircraft carriers up to Midway. The reason I was in Midway was because I was captain of a destroyer and the destroyers were there to protect the aircraft carriers, you know, from submarines. So the aircraft carriers hid behind Midway. So the Japanese came up to capture, and the American aircraft came down and they sank the Japanese Navy. Thank goodness. But that was the battle that won the war. And you know, Midway is nothing. It's a funny little island up north someplace. MacArthur was absolutely fabulous. He was the most amazing person anywhere. And uh, if it wasn't for MacArthur, we wouldn't have much left. But General MacArthur was very kind and very smart and very, his timing was fabulous. 
America started with very little and became the most powerful name in the world because of the leaders. The leaders were good. Everybody has to defend his country and they have to sh share the defense. That's all. They all did too. Yeah. I lived in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I naturally, I, I was just past my 19th birthday. This was on December the 7th, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And then, on the morning of the 8th, my father came home from driving the streetcar, and he said, go around and get the car. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, join the Navy. I had been trying to join the Navy Reserves for two years, but my father wouldn't let me. So we went down and we were the first ones in the state of Indiana to go through. When the old reserve guys came in at 7.30 in the morning, we were the first ones through the door and we signed me in. My crew that I trained with went to the west coast and we went through and went to Treasure Island. And they picked out, I think about 90 of us, and they sent us up to Tiburon, California. And up there we were making the submarine nets to go just inside the Golden Gate Bridge, which was slave labor. When I signed up, I was an apprentice seaman. But I found out how can I get off of this building submarine nets and how can I work my way out of this? And I was intelligent enough to know if you can pass the test to become a gunner's mate third class, and I did that. The first time I took the test, I became a gunner's mate third class. Well, there's no place on a little net tender or when you're building submarine nets for a gunner's mate. That ended up getting me on the Ellet. What a wonderful little ship she was, and what a privilege to be just the right age to find that little ship and then be in all those battles. The Battle of Santa Cruz, some historian call it the Battle of the Eastern Solomons. We were with the Enterprise, and we were about six miles over, and the Hornet was the carrier that was with us, and the Japanese were coming. It looked like a hornet's nest that day. And the only thing that saved the Enterprise, a storm coming, it might be a mile square. It'll be coming, sweeping across the ocean, sun shining everywhere, and here comes this storm walking across the ocean. And so we accompanied the Enterprise and she went into this storm. And we were all around the edge of the storm and the torpedo planes that hadn't dropped their torpedoes, they spotted us outside and one managed to come through the storm and evidently he had still had his torpedo on board and I believe that that pilot would probably be badly wounded because there were no kamikaze that early in the war. This was October the 26th. 1942 and one of my loaders on my I was on a 20 millimeter machine gun that day and one of the guys kept hitting me and he pointed and this torpedo plane got a little bit too close to me and when I was machine gunning him I started probably two to three seconds too late and he blew up my face and he burned my arms and he burned my face that's the reason for the beard because as I'm nearly 93 now when I try to shave my face bleeds when you're 19, 20 years old, you're just full of it. And believe it or not, I thought I was having fun. I really did think, it reminded me, I thought, well, I remember paying a quarter at the carnivals and the state fair, and they'd give you the little short 22 rifle to shoot at a target, and you'd win for your little girlfriend. You'd win a little Cupid doll or a teddy bear or something. Well, I'm not shooting at a little target with 22. I'm shooting at real Japanese airplanes. And I thought, man, this is fun. And I really did think it was fun. The only battle out there that we missed at all was Tarawa. But Tarawa was hard on the Marines. I'm thinking something like eight or 10,000 Marines died taking Tarawa. A lot of people don't know it, but you see all the Marines did the fighting in World War II until we got to the Philippines. And then in the Philippines, it was all Army under MacArthur. The little Ellet was so important 
She saved so many people and it was such a wonderful thing to get that experience, to be on her for four years. What a blessing. I look back now and I think that that really happened. It sure did. nurses training, one of my teachers had been in the war and that was my ambition, was to be a nurse in the war. So when that came around, I immediately joined the Red Cross, because that was the only way you could get in to see the world, and I was stationed 100 miles from home at Joplin, Missouri. And they were asking for nurses for Topeka, Kansas for the Air Force. So I transferred to the Army Air Force, and while we were there, my friend decided we should go to school to be an air evac nurse. So we went to Bowman Field, Louisville, Kentucky, and we went through school to be nurses on airplane. And my first station there, instead of getting way overseas someplace, was Newfoundland. But didn't stay there very long, then I went to the Azores. The Azores were neutral, and the British had a contract with the Azores, and we were guests of the British. It was interesting to be on the Azores because here we are fighting the Germans and there were German people on the Azores. And from the Azores, we flew patients back to the States, depending on the weather. If it was good, we went to New York through Newfoundland. And if it was bad, we went to uh, Miami. And it, when we had to go, to, we had to stop at Bermuda for gas. And from Azores to Bermuda it was 13 hours, and we carried 13 hours of gas. On these trips, there was always a point of no return. If you had engine trouble before that point, you went home. If it was after that point, you went on to wherever you were supposed to go. Now, I remember one day we sort of limped into Newfoundland on one engine. These were four engine planes. These are C-54s. And when I first started flying, they carried gas on the inside and that didn't leave, they had great big tanks of gas on the inside of the plane. Didn't leave much room for the cargo. You took care of patients on the airplane. The men were picked up and given some first aid treatment, and when they got well enough, then they were put on a plane and on a litter. The litter was hooked onto the side of the airplane on one side, and then they had straps that dropped down from the ceiling, and the other part of the, of the litter was put in the strap. So the, the uh, plane had about four tiers of litters on each side. They didn't have much room between them. After VE Day, they sent us to Hawaii, and we flew from Hawaii to all the little islands, Guam, Johnson Island, Manila, uh, Johnson was just a filling station, you know, and um, the men there said the only thing about Johnson was that there was a woman behind every tree. The trouble was there weren't any trees. So, and I was in Manila, and three days after that, I was sent to Tokyo to bring back a load of patients on these long flights. We always had box lunches and sometimes we'd sort of have a nice picnic. Get all the patients down on the floor and, and give them their box lunches. And uh, sometimes the, uh, the crew would come back and shoot dice down the hall to entertain the, the patients. I brought back one load of patients to New York one time that were just brought back to die. And that was the only load that when we got into of the harbor of New York. Before you had landed, you went around and, and straightened out the, the litters and tucked the blankets around them. And, and, and then we'd come into New York City and everybody would be up looking out the window. They wanted to see the Statue of Liberty. But that load, they, they were so sick, they didn't even care. It was sad. It certainly changed my life. Uh, I. Uh, sort of fell in love with the service. As a nurse, we were sort of on a pedestal anyway. As an Aravac, we really were on a pedestal because 
Aerovac was the new thing. Well, first Air Force was new, and then the Aerovac was new, so they got everything they wanted. Uh, and a nurse um, at Aerovac, we could bump a general. Because <laughs> uh, we had high priority. We had to get back and get to a station and bring back some more patients, you know. Thank you.